Okay, so we are in our Grow Up series, and we're coming towards the end. This is the second to last week, um, so I'll be preaching today, and then Bree will be closing us out next week. Um, so yeah, for those of you who haven't been here throughout this series, we've been talking about this concept of growing up. Um, so just what are the fundamentals of spiritual maturity? What should a, a follower of Christ, what are these essentials that any follower of Christ needs to grow up and mature in? Uh, so we've talked about worldliness. We've talked about money and how we think about our resources. Um, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about keeping your head. Um, and before I start, I have a cool new technological integration for our service this morning. So we're going to pilot this, see how it works. So who here has the Bible app? Don't ask me which Bible app. There's only one, right? So... <laughs> If you have the Bible app, you can open that up and you can follow along with the sermon notes through there. This is cool. This is game changing. You thought John's sermon last week was cool with the one point. but So if you open your Bible app and in the bottom menu, you click the more link at the bottom right and then you click on events, then you should see Wiley Northeast Church. Does anyone see it? Anyone found it yet? Bible app, more, events, Wiley Northeast Church. Has anyone found it yet? Okay, a few people found it. <laughs> yeah, you can't go to any of the other churches or else you're excommunicated or something. So, yeah, feel free to follow along on there. Let me know what you think of it. Maybe we can convince the other preachers to do this. Maybe it'll flop. Who knows? All right. So if you don't have that, we also have slides so you can follow along with those. And I'm pretty proud of this meme that I made right here. It seems like a very nice lady telling us to keep our head. So if she says it, I think we should do it. Um, so yeah, this idea of keeping your head is what I'm going to talk about today. And so I, I want to start just by reading the scripture passage that I'm referencing when I say keep your head. Um, so this is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. This is Paul talking to Timothy. He says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside the myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing." So yeah, Paul's talking to Timothy, this new minister that he's been discipling, and telling him that people are going to be pushing and pulling on him with all these doctrines. He's going to encounter hardship in these hard times, and how is he supposed to respond to that? He says to keep his head in all situations. And so when I hear this phrase, keep your head, I think of two different aspects of that. I think of emotional maturity, where we're uh, steadfast emotionally and able to, to handle these challenges in life that present great emotional difficulty for us? How are we supposed to navigate that and wade through just all the junk that life throws at us? And then the other aspect of keeping our head is critical thinking. So when we're bombarded by different philosophies and ideas, um, when people are trying to get us to believe what they believe, tell us what we're supposed to believe, um, how are we supposed to know what's right and true? How are we supposed to think critically uh, as we follow Jesus? In both our emotional and logical cores, we need to be constantly vigilant to keep our heads 
and not be swayed by the winds of our time, but to be steadfast and constant in following Christ. So I had planned for this to be a 50-50 sermon talking about emotional maturity and critical thinking, but it's basically 90% emotional maturity, and then we'll talk just a tiny bit about critical thinking at the end. Um, so yeah, let's start off with emotional maturity. So yeah, I just want to spend this time asking, what, what does an emotionally healthy disciple, follower of Christ, look like? And as we examine that, let's start by talking about a few things that an emotionally healthy disciple does not look like. I think there's two, two extremes, both which are very unhealthy, that people can fall into when trying to deal with their emotions. So the first emotional response is to just suppress and ignore your emotions. But I don't think we become emotionally mature by hiding and repressing these emotions. Um, so thinking of, of who these kind of people might be like, um, I think of like uh, Spock and the Vulcans. Does that reference ring true with anyone? Okay. If Star Wars, yes. That was a Star Wars reference. If that's like too old school for you, then maybe you can think of Anna from Frozen, who's taught that she needs to repress and conceal her true identity. Whichever one works for you. Elsa! <laughs> Dang it! <laughs> so I'm too old. Wow. This is embarrassing. <laughs> wow. Elsa from Frozen, right. On is probably the opposite extreme there. Um, so yeah, these, these kind of people who think that the path to maturity is hiding, suppressing. If you don't feel any emotions, then you've achieved some sort of ideal state um, where you're not affected by these typical human emotions. But I don't think that's the kingdom vision for a mature disciple. God wants us to come into the light and expose ourselves before him with all our junk. He doesn't expect us to wait till we've got everything under control. I love the line from the song, Come Ye Sinners. It says, if you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. So praise God that he accepts us in our brokenness, in our frailty, in all these crazy emotions that we feel. Um, God accepts us. And this, is, this has been a hard one for me. I remember um, a few years ago, I started encountering some of the most extreme emotions I'd ever felt. I had just gone through a breakup and was seriously struggling in the aftermath of that. I had already had anxiety that I had been dealing with, and that only amplified it. And it felt like I had put all my eggs in that one basket. And so when that was over, I was just left feeling so empty and sad and insecure. Um, often I found myself just weeping in my car. My anxiety flared to new heights. It was hard to get out of bed and push past these butterflies in my stomach, feeling overwhelmed by work and all these responsibilities I had to deal with. And I felt so bad about, about feeling so bad during this time. I was supposed to be a leader in this church, to be someone who has it all together. But I had the completely wrong idea about that again. So what, what are you supposed to do there when you're bombarded by emotions like that, by situations that that wreck you and, and cause this turmoil inside of you? Should I have told myself that it's trivial and immature to be so wrecked by a relationship that didn't last even three months? That may be true, and I could try to mentally tell myself that as much as I want, but those emotions aren't going away. That experience triggered something deep inside of me. It exposed insecurities that I wasn't fully aware of, priorities and hopes and dreams that maybe I'd never vocalized, but that were lying there underneath. So while there's certainly a head-level reckoning that needs to be done in times like that, in the midst of all that, there's still the heart, these deep and raw emotions that you can't just reason yourself out of. And I think we have good biblical examples of, of people wrestling with these really raw and tough emotions. The psalmists, especially King David, I think are the, the best examples here. And then Jesus himself. In Isaiah, he was described as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He didn't hide or repress that. So yeah, let's, let's not think of a strong and mature Christian as someone who's protected from emotions, from 
deep grief or high highs of joy and happiness. We shouldn't be people who are, are stealing ourselves and closing ourselves off to, to these human experiences that come with life. There's a song I love called Hello, My Old Heart. Uh, it's by the Oh Hellos. Another perk of this Bible app thing is I was able to link the Spotify song in there. So if you care to listen, it's in there. Um, but it speaks to this tendency to lock our hearts up. It says, hello, my old heart, how have you been? How is it being locked away? Don't you worry, and there you're safe. And it's true you'll never beat, but you'll never break. So if you want to be safe from these waves of human emotions, you can lock your heart up and build some walls around it. But don't be surprised when you find yourself becoming disconnected from yourself, from others, and then ultimately from God in whose image we were made. As I was preparing for this sermon, um, I realized, yeah, we were made in God's image, even in our emotions. Um, have you ever thought that God is an emotional? He's an emotional being. And I, I had to kind of look that up and like research. I'm like, is that true? Um, but we see that clearly uh, throughout Scripture. And so um, I've listed uh, a bunch of different scriptures. I think there's a slide with this, yeah. So these are just some emotions that we see throughout Scripture that God has and expresses. He's angry. We see him rise up against injustice, things that make him angry. He has compassion on us. He grieves. He loves and he hates, which is a hard one for us to wrestle with. What, is, what does God's hatred look like? But Scripture speaks about both his love and his hate. And it speaks about his jealousy. He's so jealous for his people, Israel, so jealous for his church. And then it speaks about the joy of God. But yeah, you might consider reading and looking into some of those verses and seeing how Scripture talks about our maker and creator who experiences these emotions. So if we're made in his image, I think those emotions are a good thing that God intended us to have. But yeah, that might be weird for us to hear because as human beings, we've greatly distorted emotions. Many of the worst acts and sins committed by humans are done at the height of some sort of emotional outburst. We see people completely lose themselves inside the grip of certain emotions. But then many of us have swung to this opposite end of the spectrum, seeing emotions as altogether bad. And I struggle with this when I'm in conflict with someone. If I'm Arguing with someone, I see whoever's the emotional person in that argument is the one that's wrong because they're clearly subjective and, and not able to think clearly. And that's just not the case. Emotions are, we all have them. They're a healthy thing, but they can certainly become very unhealthy. They're not dealt with well. And so, yeah, let's talk about now this, this other emotional response of being dominated and ruled by our emotions. So this is the other extreme where we put our emotions and our feelings on a pedestal to where we're completely ruled by them. This person might feel a certain way, and if they feel it, then they're always going to act in line with that feeling. Because how else would they be authentic to themselves? The person ruled by emotions rarely does anything that they don't want to. They worship God on their own terms. They love others on their own terms. And when time gets tough... And they give up and go try something else. But how would Scripture instruct a person who's not feeling it to handle themselves? We're all well aware of the verse Philippians 4, 4 through 9. I think this is a great counter to that, that mindset of just acting on whatever we feel at the time. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. 
So yeah, this principle teaches us that we have to constantly redirect ourselves to God and to his truth. As emotions hit us hard, as we get barraged by that, we have to present all of that before God and let his peace overwhelm us and teach us. We have to commit to thinking and meditating on the things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. Do you think about these things? If you think back to this last week and what dominated your mind, is it those sorts of things? Or are you someone who's constantly negative, constantly catastrophizing everything? We're commanded to be ruled by the peace of God, not by the chaos of our own hearts and minds. Listen to another example from the Psalms of how these emotions are dealt with. Psalm 42, 1 through 6. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Notice he doesn't say, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I'll mope around and stop doing all the good things I know I should be. I think that's too often our response to feeling bad, to, to having these emotions that overwhelm us. But again, see this pattern of our instant response is to turn to God, to thirst for him, to bring our, our laments, to bring our joy, every emotion we feel before him. <laughs> A couple years ago, this was kind of after the, the period of intense anxiety and extreme emotion, after that, I kind of fell into a period where I was just feeling very apathetic. I um, feel like maybe kind of over-rotated to the other side. I was struggling to feel the presence of God, to feel this joy in following him. I was wondering, how am I supposed to follow God and, not, and, and worship him when I'm not feeling very spiritual or feeling his presence? And I talked with Ronnie Worsham about that and just shared and asked for some thoughts. Uh, and yeah, what he said with me stuck with me. I've, I've probably shared it here a few times already. But he was just telling me how God's probably more honored by us choosing to follow him even when we're not feeling that way, even when our emotions don't line up, when we're not naturally feeling this outpouring of a desire to worship him, when we still choose to dig in and follow him and pursue him. God's very honored by that. So I'd encourage you if you struggle, um, yeah, not feeling... Connected to God, um, not feeling like pursuing that, do it anyway. You know what's right. You know what you're supposed to do. And it's not unauthentic to, to do something that you don't want to do. Um, we don't have to always be chasing around our desires and our wants. Uh, there's a book called The Signature of Jesus by Brennan Manning. And there's a chapter that's titled Celebrate the Darkness. It's a pretty unusual name. Um, but he's talking about this idea of the dark night of the soul. And yeah, it's, it's kind of this, this thing I was describing that I felt, this period in the life of Christians where you seem to have lost your joy, your desire to follow God. Maybe there's some event in your life that's just hurt you deeply um, and you're going through this dark night of the soul, struggling to feel God's presence. And he writes about how God is most assuredly still with us and very near to us in those times. He says this quote here. He says, The Christian who surrenders in trust to this truth, the truth that Jesus is near us in those times, finds Jesus Christ in a new way. It marks the beginning of a deeper life of faith where joy and peace flourish even in the darkness because they are rooted not in superficial human feelings, but deep down in the dark certainty of faith that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, today, and forever. The very inability to feel his presence with our unstable emotions 
or to appreciate his goodness with our feeble thoughts becomes a help rather than a hindrance. Joy and sorrow may play havoc with our feelings, but beneath this shifting surface, God dwells in the darkness. It is there that we go to meet him. It is there that we pray in peace, silent and attentive to the God whose love knows no shadow of change. It is there that we celebrate the darkness in the quiet certainty of mature faith. That gives me chills just reading that, that that vision for what this this mature faith in God could look like, that even as we're barraged by all these emotions, by this dark night of the soul, we can still just have this steadfast faith and trust in God. Say, I'd encourage you, don't wait to feel good before worshiping God and doing what you know is right. Consider it both a blessing when you get to, be, to tangibly, tangibly experience the goodness of God, and also a blessing when you're being taught how to follow him in the midst of that dark night of the soul. The last thing I want to talk about real quick on emotions is just this vision of, yeah, what, what healthy emotional uh, maturity could look like and, and this vision of, of experiencing emotions that align with the heart of God. We talked about how God has emotions. Do we care about, about the same things that God cares about? Do we share his heart? I think as we become more and more intimate with him, we should see ourselves being affected by the same things that he is. So again, just think about the things, maybe these past few weeks, that currently get you the most emotional. Are these the same things that stir the heart of God? I know for me they're often very different. I'd love for my emotions to be transformed from getting the most angry about a roommate leaving a mess to getting most angry about others being treated unjustly. Or from being most happy and joyful when I throw the perfect disc golf shot to being most happy when I I see someone who encounters Jesus and is changed by him. I don't want to trivialize the day-to-day emotions that we feel. They matter and God cares about these minute details of our lives. But are we growing and maturing towards these kingdom-centric emotions where, where we adapt and, and discover the heart of God and care about the things he cares about? Or are we constantly stuck in the myopic view of our own little world? Jesus tells us where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I think we could adapt that and just say where your emotions are, there your heart will be also which is probably pretty redundant because we already use heart language to refer to emotions. But yeah, I think that's a really easy self-examination. What do I feel most strongly about? What do I experience emotions most strongly about? I think that's telling you something about where your heart is. Yeah, I don't like the way I stack up when I examine myself this way, but I thank God for his grace that teaches and transforms me and can shape my heart to, to care about the things he cares about. All right, let's uh, talk about critical thinking for just a little bit, and we'll close out. Yeah, we talked about this, this emotional side of keeping your head. There's also this very important side of critical thinking. Listen again to these verses where Paul is talking about this um, from, from the Second Timothy passage. He says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Yeah, as people, we want to hear what we want to hear. We want to believe what we want to believe. And it's crazy how good we are at doing this and convincing ourselves that we're being perfectly logical and objective. But we have to be sharp and cunning as followers of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul says, I'm afraid just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Satan is very real and very active. 
God created humans, put them in the garden, and right away Satan's trying to deceive them and pull them away. And he's still doing that today. He's trying to lead us astray from following Christ and to follow some other gospel. And we can easily get so far from Christ while we're still thinking that we're serving him. Think of the Pharisees who thought that they were in right standing with God, but were about as far from him as they could be. So how can we ensure that we're able to keep our heads grounded, keep our heads and stay grounded in the midst of all this tug of war for our hearts and minds? I think the, the most important thing is we have to make sure we're rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ and his word. Our relationship with him can't be secondhand through pastors and other Christians. We have to personally know his voice. Listen to John 10, 1 through 5. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So do you know Jesus' voice, or do you just know James Sanderland's voice? Are you intimate enough with Jesus and his word that you can discern the difference? When someone's up here speaking and something doesn't line up with his word, are you quick to, to tell that? Uh, Ronnie Worsham tells this neat story of a while back he was doing this work training. And if you've ever heard Ronnie speak, he throws scriptures into everything he says without really quoting them explicitly. explicitly. And he could tell in that room who the Jesus followers were because they would kind of perk up whenever they heard the words of their master. So are we people who recognize Jesus' voice, who can instantly identify it? Um, we have to train that and we have to be diligent and disciplined in studying scripture, being intimate with Jesus to learn that. And Bree's going to be talking next week a lot more about spiritual disciplines and how we can stay rooted and grounded in Jesus in this way. And the other thing about keeping our head in critical thinking is just to encourage you not to fall for the crazy politicizing that happens all around us. On both sides of the aisle, you're forced into this set of accepted and unaccepted beliefs. Do you question and analyze and critically think about these things? Or do you just blindly accept what you're told to believe because your side says that anyone who doesn't believe X is a monster? We have to be ruled by the word of God, not by some political party or the whims of our culture. So I'm going to close out with a few practicals, both on the emotional and critical thinking side of this. Just some things we can do to, to practice this steadfastness and in, in keeping of our heads. First off is just to have this recurring prayer asking God to shape your heart. It doesn't have to be a long, complicated prayer. I've found simple one-line, one-sentence prayers to be very effective for me recently. Uh, they can be these quick redirections of our mind when we catch ourselves thinking or feeling a certain way. So just train yourself whenever maybe you start feeling overwhelmed by emotions. Um, yeah, whenever throughout your day you're starting to feel disconnected, just pray, God, shape my heart. And just those four words, let that be a touch point for you to reach out to God and ask him to shape you. Spend time in meditation and ask God, what does he care about most deeply? Ask him to instill those values in your own heart. It's going to take time to learn from him, to sit at his feet and hear from him, but, but take the time to do that. Be introspective. Like I said earlier, your emotions can teach you a lot about the things that you value. Um, you know, you might say you believe one thing or feel about a certain way about one thing, but I think your emotions aren't going to lie about how you actually feel. So learn from them. Um, introspect. Think about it. Don't repress or stuff them away, but be open and vulnerable with those emotions before God and before other people. Journal. Um, I found journaling to be an incredible way to expose and clarify my own heart thoughts 
and to hear God's word in response to those things. If you haven't ever practiced journaling, I'd encourage you to try that out. Be emotionally vulnerable with others. So again, don't hide from people. Don't suppress your emotions. Bring that into the light. Maybe have an emotional accountability partner where you can just check in with them and and talk about how you've been feeling, how you've been handling your emotions, the emotions you've been feeling. Practice Sabbath. Sabbath is a huge thing that I think a lot of us just ignore and don't think is important. But I think as we talk about keeping our head and staying steadfast, we have to be grounded in God. We have to have these rhythms of rest. Um, I think it's going to be a lot more easy to stay steadfast when hard times come if we've built these rhythms of rest and connection to God into our lives. And then on the critical thinking thing of si- side of things, start conversations with people who believe opposite of you. Not arguments. I'd encourage you to sit down with someone and just try to understand what they think, what they believe, how they got there. Um, try to have a productive conversation about that with someone. Probably in person instead of online because that often doesn't go well. And read books and articles that have different viewpoints than your own. Again, with this critical thinking, we just pile ourselves up with resources that support our own um, dispositions, our own beliefs. So seek out these opinions and viewpoints from people opposite of you. So read, talk to people. Um, I think that'll be a really good way to sharpen yourself. And then, again, bring it all back to the Word of God and submit all that before God. Yeah, let me say a prayer to close this out. God, I thank you, um, yeah, that you made us in your image to to have this full range of emotions and to experience life in that way um, can be a really sweet gift. We thank you for the minds you gave us to be able to think and process things and analyze things. And I ask in, in both of these areas, as we deal with our emotions, as we think about things, that we would submit that to you and that you would teach us and shape us in all of that, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.